convince us to support them and then go to Washington, D.C. and do something completely different. Is that not a reasonable conclusion that we could draw? I can see the age of the group. There's many of us who have gone through many election cycles and seen this process over and over. I think in the second district, we have been deceived by our elected representative. And it's something we need to correct and we can do so here in May. The other issue I want to point out real quickly is debt and deficits, $18 trillion in debt. That is a national security problem for the United States of America. I remind you what national security means. We think about it in military terms, of course. But what is the essence of what we're trying to do when we talk about protecting our national security? We're talking about protecting our way of life. How we live, the organizing principles of our U.S. society, the U.S. Constitution, free market capitalism, individual responsibility, the manner in which we have set up our society with precincts and counties and states to make up the United States of America our standard of living, how we pursue work, how we form families, how we form business. This is national security. That is the point of military, to allow us to live within the borders of our great country, within the borders of our communities, and do as we please, with freedom being the overriding principle. And so when we're talking about $18 trillion in national debt, add on another $5 trillion, ladies and gentlemen, add on another $5 trillion in state debt, and now the U.S. is at $23 trillion in debt right now. Unprecedented in human history, or in any organizing society ever that's been imagined on our planet. It's hard for us to even imagine what $23 trillion is. Uh, once you can go on the internet and there's all kinds of fun little games you can play to, to find ways to measure trillions. When we were at $17 trillion in debt about a year and a half ago, I went online and did one, and I found that if you would <coughs> So uh, if you were to consume goods and services of $2 million a day from the day Jesus Christ was born, you'd just be at $17 trillion today. The point is, it's a national security risk. And we see it right now in Washington, D.C. with respect to what's happening in the budget debate about the U.S. military. We all know, we can see what's happening with Barack Obama and how he's scaling back the U.S. military, cutting spending because of the difficult allocation we have of the scarce resources and taxes and fees that are being used for other things. And so there is your time that is hard to quantify for a long time for Republicans. Why is debt a national security issue? Well, here we are. We've reached that point. $18 trillion, it makes clear it's a national security issue. As the Navy grows smaller, as the Army grows smaller, as procurement for new equipment grows less and less, as we become less ready and able to fight a two-front war, or two wars on two separate fronts. These are real issues, and our representative in Washington, D.C. has repeatedly voted for debt ceiling increases, has repeatedly voted for more spending, and has done nothing that equates with her rhetoric in 2010 or 2012 that suggests she's a fiscal conservative. And for me, these are the two main points. Now, I've taken it further. In 2013, before I knew I was going to run for office here in the 2nd District, because I thought we had elected a conservative, I decided my one other way to try to get involved in the national debate and change the direction America was going was to write a book. And I wrote a book. It's on the table. It's called Five, The Five Structural Barriers to American Strength and Prosperity. Being an economics and financial market expert, I took it from that perspective under the ideas that you and I talk about all the time. They talk to us and they ask us, what are our concerns? And we say jobs, the economy, and unemployment. It's been the mantra for several cycles now. And so I took those three things and I whittled it down to the five key policy measures coming out of Washington, D.C. that make us think like that, that make us believe our future is at risk. And they are, number one, immigration. Number two, debt and deficits. Number three, U.S. unilateral free trade policy most evident with our relationship with China and the hollowing out that's occurring in our manufacturing base that's painfully evident all around the second district. Number four, overregulation led by Obamacare and Dodd-Frank. Let's not forget Sarbanes-Oxley Oxley from the 1990s. 262 major regulations passed last year, the most on record in U.S. history. Major regulation is that regulation that is presumed to impact the U.S. economy at a value of $100 billion or more. A new record last year. And then lastly, our education system. <coughs> what do we have? 
No Child Left Behind. That was a trade-off George Bush made with Teddy Kennedy. So the left got their No Child Left Behind in education. That apparently didn't work, right? Because by the time Barack Obama got into office, he decided we need to race to the top. That was in place for a year, two years, and all of a sudden we're going for Common Core, and now we have Common Core overtaking our school systems across the country without teacher or political input. Certainly not at the local level, or even parental input. And we know these unbelievable graphics we're seeing on the internet of students trying to do math problems in multi-step phases when the simple process is, you know, four minus two equals two. I don't need a math sentence to, to solve that equation. So we know education remains a problem. And sadly, of course, it's a problem every two years, isn't it? Again, I hate to do this to you, but I can see how old we are as a group. We've lived through the same process the past 30 years. Every two years, we talk about education. And every two years, what happens? It gets worse. And every two years, if another governor candidate comes up, another senatorial candidate, another congressional candidate, I'm going to do this. And usually, it's spend more money, reduce classroom size. That's a much bigger problem than that. It's tied to immigration. It's tied to trade policy. You want to talk about immigration? Don't talk to me about suburban America. Talk to me about rural and urban America. You want to see where the real problems are for our future? The long-term national security risk for our labor force as a result of the failings for tens of millions of our fellow Americans, black and Hispanic, in urban and rural America, being left behind whole swaths of our population that will be a burden for us in the future as a result of our failing education system. It's serious. This is When we talk about education, forget about the nuances we talk about, about teachers and students and growing into the prosperous adults. Talk about the long-term viability of a society. And we're on the wrong path when it comes to that area. This is what I'm focused on. My background is economics and finance. I hold a master's degree in economics. I spent 20 years working in capital markets as a currency trader, putting that education to work. I've been trying to find a way to become part of the national debate for some time. And for the past four or five years, I've decided that elected office is the best way to do that. I put my profession on hold. I'm living off my savings account. I see drop every single day. But it's, that's how important this is to me, the passion I have for regaining pride, selfishly for myself, but also for my family, my five sisters, my fellow citizens in the second district. You here in this room, wouldn't it be great, great to be proud of America? Unequivocally again, to be proud of our federal government if it was in balance, imagine we had a balanced budget, and we lived within our means, and we lived within the Constitution, right? We, were, we had a future that was bright and, and, and not full of risk as it is now, that we didn't have a vision that more Detroit's are on the way. So I need you to go to frankroachforcongress.com. I need you to make sure that what I'm saying today is affirmed there, because there's a ton of video, there's audio, my background, I actually have a resume on the website. How many candidates have you seen present a web resume to provide their credentials to make, them, make it clear they are prepared for the job? So please, do your homework. And then when you find out how the guy you want to change things in Washington, D.C., one vote at a time, one argument at a time, I need you to tell everybody you know. Because the key to incumbency is the power of name recognition and the ability to raise money with ease. Why do you think 90% of incumbents get reelected? because we don't do enough homework as voters for those that oppose them. And we have a clear example. This is a test for Republicans. We have a Republican who went to office who deceived us and has clearly now made it clear she is no longer on our side. This is it. This is the example. She should be removed, regardless of if you think she's nice or if she can raise more money. These are disqualifying events. That's why we have the two-year cycle. So I need you to tell as many people as you can, Frank Roach for Congress, I want an opportunity to demonstrate to my fellow citizens in the second district that we can talk one way and vote the same way in Washington, D.C. Please give me that opportunity. Thank you all very much.